Hey there, welcome to another video. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find some inverse trig functions. So based on something like that, can we find an inverse function? I want to refresh your memory just a little bit about what we need in order for this to happen. For sine, cosine, and tangent, we had to restrict the domain in order to create a one-to-one -one piece of this function about which we could find an inverse. And so what I want you to remember is that for sine, in order for us to find an inverse, your domain has to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 inclusive. For cosine, it's 0 to pi inclusive. And for tangent, it's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 without those endpoints in it. We have to make sure that whatever is here falls in whatever is there. So there's a few things that I really need you to get. Number one, when you find an inverse, the first thing that we're going to do is find the domain and the range. Why? Well, because for an inverse function, inputs and outputs change, domain becomes range and range becomes domain. So if we can find our domain and our range of our original function, we automatically have the domain and the range of our inverse, they're just reversed. And that's, that makes it so much nicer than trying to find domain twice and trying to find range twice. So we're gonna do that first. Secondly, I need you to think of this X in the broadest possible sense. What I need you to think of it is as whatever's here must be somewhere between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. I have interval notation and inequality notation in, both, in all these cases. Uh, we'll mostly use this one. I'm going to show you why that is. I'm just making the transition because I know I've used this and I want you to be familiar with this as well. So in the broadest sense of it, whatever's inside my function must be somewhere between these values and we're going to use that to find domain. The last thing we're going to talk about is range. Remember what range is. The biggest possible value sine can ever get is 1, and same for cosine. And the smallest possible value sine can ever get is negative 1, same for cosine. Tangent goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, or positive to negative if you reflect it. And we're going to use that to find our range as well. So I'm going to lead you through a series of steps that are honestly not all that hard. If you remember how to find the inverse of any function, then the inverse of this is exactly the same. We're just going to use the appropriate inverse, like sine inverse for sine, cosine inverse cosine, and so forth. So let's get started. Before we go anywhere, when finding an inverse function, we want to find the domain and we want to find the range. And so here's what we do. For the domain, we look inside this, we identify what, what, what tree function we have. 5 sine x plus 2, and that parenthesis is very important, saying that plus 2 is outside of the function. It's not inside that, it's not, it's not a, a left or right phase shift, if you will. Um, this is a vertical shift, so it's affecting the outputs. It's not affecting the domain. That's important, it's not nice an input, it's not affecting the domain. And so we're identifying, firstly, well, what function we have. If we have sine, as we do here, we know that the domain has to be this in order for us to be able to find an inverse function. That's, that's got to really make sense. It's got to make sense that we had to cut the domain so that we had a one-to-one -one function so that we could find an inverse. Well, what that means is that we still have to obey this. And here's the way I'm always going to lead you to, to find domain with our trig functions, at least for the inverses. We're going to take whatever's here and put it in between whatever's here for the appropriate function. In this case, it's just x. So we're going to say, all right, for our domain, because we're dealing with sine, and we can only find the inverse of sine on a very certain portion of the x-axis, so where we have a 1 to 1 function, that's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Whatever's here, if it's not just x, like x plus 5, x minus 1, uh, 3x plus 2, whatever that is, goes here for the appropriate function that you have. That's the easiest way to find domain. And it's also why I'm leading you to inequality notation rather than interval, because you can actually do math on this, and it's the easiest way to go. So we say, what function? Okay, find the domain where we can find inverse. We got it. Put whatever's there right there. And then you would solve it. Now, this is why we learned about compound inequality is such a long, long time ago, so that you can solve things like this. Now, this has nothing to do. You're solved. You're done. You have just found your domain. Done. And that's very, very nice. So we know that in order to find the inverse of sine, we must be between these two values for our input of x. Hopefully that makes sense. The next thing we do is find the range. Now, there's a variety of ways you can do this. Sometimes you'll hear people say, hey, just plug this in, plug this in, it'll give you a range. 
that's not quite true because it doesn't have to give you the peak and the valley right at those points. So here's maybe a better way to go about it. Think about the smallest possible value that this function can be. Don't even worry about this. Just what's the highest and, and, and lowest values that sine can be? Well, the lowest value sine can be is negative one. Well, imagine that somewhere in this continuous part of this function on this domain, you're kind of kidding negative one. So let's imagine that. So imagine, hey, sine of x can, in its minimum, be negative one. Negative one times five, plus negative five, plus two is negative three. So it, it seems right that the very lowest value we could possibly get here is, is negative three. That's this, oh man, so the, the smallest thing you get here is negative one times five plus two is negative three. And you could actually get it out. You would use a bracket there. Now what's the largest value? Well, sine of x, whatever the, the largest sine could ever get, right here, this little piece is one. 5 times 1 is 5, plus 2 is 7. So the largest value this function could be is 7. So we're just really taking what the, um, the range of our original sine function is, negative 1 to 1, and using those smallest and largest values and imagining somewhere in that interval you're going to get them, and then times 5 plus 2, or the for either negative 1 or 1, is going to give you the smallest and largest values and everything in between because we have a continuous part of that function. Now you can also see it this way. It's more common to see interval notation, but you can see it both ways. So we find domain, no problem. We can use domain to find the range. We can plug it in. You could do this. Sine of negative pi over two is negative one. Five times negative one plus two is negative three. Sine of pi over two is one. Five times one plus two is seven. That's, that's also okay to do. Now that we've determined our domain and range, this can be so useful because we're going to go ahead and go through the process of finding the inverse function. And once we do, we'll already have the domain and the range for it. Range will become domain, domain will become range, but it's way easier to do it here than after you're done. So how, man, oh, I hope you remember how to actually find inverse functions. It's a several step process. The first step is instead of using function notation, replace your f of x or g of x or whatever your function name is with y. No problem, that's pretty easy. After that, we change our y into an x and our x's into y's and then we solve for the y. Why? Because in doing that, it's actually operation for operation, function for function, undoing whatever you have here. So when we replace y with x, and x with y, and I tell you, hey, solve for y, you're gonna to have to undo the plus two. You're gonna to have to undo the times five. You're gonna to have to undo the function sign with an inverse. That's completely undoing this, and that's what inverses do. Inverses undo functions. <clears throat> term for term, uh, operation for operation, function for function. So we're gonna go ahead and solve for y right now. When you have to solve an inverse or solve for a variable like this, you have to isolate whatever function you're dealing with. So we're going to isolate that sign. You also have to undo everything around the function. So no, no addition, no subtraction, no multiplication, nothing. So we'll divide both sides by 5. And lastly, how in the world do you solve for y now? This is why we introduced inverse functions. Inverse functions undo the, the root function, or the parent function. So if we have sine of y, what does sine? Sine inverse. That's how we introduce it. We know that they undo each other. We are going to in purposely introduce a composition of an inverse and its root function. A composition of an inverse and a function, or a function and inverse, always cancel. That was the whole last video. That's why we did that. But you had to meet the domain. That's exactly why we do the domain first, to say, hey, this is only going to be valid if we meet this. Where'd this come from? Where our cut up x-axis caused us to have a one-to-one -one function so that we could even have an inverse. So this says, this is when it's one-to-one. -one. 
This is when it's one-to-one -one so that you'll be able to find an inverse. Let's go ahead and do it. We're right here and it says, because you've met your domain, now you can actually find or use the inverse because it will be one-to-one -one on this portion of the x-axis. That's the whole thing all wrapped up. And it's pretty cool. So when we do a sine inverse, once you do to one side, you have to do it on the other and you have to put it in order. So we're gonna have sine inverse of the left, sine inverse of the right, and here's, here it is again, sine inverse of sine of y. We know that inverse functions kill off functions. If you compose a function's inverse, they're done. You're just gonna get y, and the reason why this works is because this domain fits this. It's because we, we, we cut it. We said on this part, it's one to one. It satisfies the inverse. And that right there is our inverse function. We just have to call it that. So we're gonna say instead of y, we're gonna name it back as the function that we had with an inverse notation. So f with that little negative one thing that we say f inverse, <laughs> don't say f to the negative one, or f little minus one thing, for that before too. Um, this is pronounced f inverse. So this is f inverse, it's the inverse of f. These are inverse functions that we've named that. That says f inverse is sine inverse of x minus two plus five. Now, if you were to compose these, these should actually cancel out. And you can probably see it, check this out. If you compose this here, where that is, sine of sine inverse would immediately cancel because you met that domain. You'd have x minus two over five, five over five cancels, x minus two plus two gives you x, and that's exactly what should happen. When you compose a function and inverse, everything should cancel and you should get x at the very end. And that would actually happen either way we compose those, provided we're on that domain. Now, the last thing we're gonna do, because we already figured out the domain and the range, remember that with inverse functions, they switch. So the range is now our domain. And what we see is that our input has to be between negative three and seven inclusive. And our output, f of f inverse of x, that is the output for this function, will be between negative pi over two and pi over two. So we just take these, we switch them because inputs become outputs, outputs become inputs that happen right here. So our domain and our range also have to change. Um, notice something, remember that the the inputs for sine inverse are from negative one to one. Check out what happens. If you plug in negative three, negative three minus two is negative five, negative five or negative five, sorry, negative five over five is negative one. Seven, seven minus two is five, five over five is one. This is the boundary of the smallest and largest values we can even put into sine inverse. That's why we did it first here so it would make sense there. So find domains, find range, and switch them for your inverse. That's really about all there is. We're going to do maybe two more examples, talking about cosine and tangent, just so we can be complete. But this is the whole idea. The hardest part is finding domain, uh, then finding range from it. That's actually not as hard. This should make sense. We've done inverses a lot. Uh, so what we're going to do is come back and do a couple more examples. Let's get right to it. So we have g of x equals negative tangent of x plus 1 minus 3. Find your domain first. So we're going to recognize what function we're dealing with, tangent. On what portion of the x-axis can we actually find an inverse? On what portion is it one-to-one? -one? Well, that was negative pi over two to pi over two, but not inclusive. So not using that le uh, less than or equal to, uh, but just the strictly less than. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say this, we can find an inverse on that interval. Let's write the boundaries there. Remember, we're using x in the most general terms. So this can be whatever is there. Let's start by showing our our left and right portions of our uh, inequality notation for our domain. So we know, we know that whatever's here has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Since we're dealing with tangent, whatever's here has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. So we're gonna show that and say, okay, 
this part has to end up being between these two things. Let's just put this here and solve for x. If you solve for x, it will find your domain for you, which is really nice. Um, that just means we have to subtract 1. If you remember compound inequalities, what you do to the middle, you do to both sides as well. So x plus 1 minus 1 gives us x. Pi over 2 minus 1 is pi over 2 minus 1. And negative pi over 2 minus 1 is negative pi over 2 minus 1. Now that's a pretty awkward domain, but that is your domain. That gives you the smallest and largest values, not inclusively, um, that you could plug into this and actually get something out. It, I hope that's interesting to you. What if you were to plug in this value and this value? Just like the regular tangent function, if you were to plug in pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, you would get undefined. They were vertical asymptotes, if you remember that. That's why there's no equals there. That's why there's no equals here and here. I hope you like that technique. I hope it actually makes sense to you. Uh, sometimes it looks like magic. You know, where did that come from? It's, it's not hard. Identify the function, identify the domain, and put whatever's there in between them. And then solve it. You have just found your domain. Now, as far as your range is concerned, we need to understand where tangent goes. Tangents ranges from negative infinity to infinity. Well, if this goes eventually from negative infinity to negative to positive infinity, negative infinity times a negative that's positive infinity plus three, it's still positive infinity. What about positive infinity times negative one to be negative infinity plus three is still negative infinity. So our range is still going to be all real numbers here. So we've taken the time. We said tangent must be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Oh, sorry. The, um, the domain of tangent is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. This is what we put between there. We say this has to fit there. And then we solve it. Range is not too bad. And now we're going to solve for the inverse function. So we're going to replace our function name, g of x, with y. We're going to switch our y to x and our x's to y. And then we're going to solve for y. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's add 3. We're going to try to isolate that tangent and then use a tan inverse. You cannot use a tan inverse. You can't use any inverse function without the function right by itself like that. So we're going to add 3 and then divide by negative 1, actually. So adding 3, we'll divide by negative 1. If we divide by negative 1, this whole thing is over negative 1. And we get negative x minus 3. Now we're ready to take tan inverse. So we're, I'm going to write that. I'm going to write tan inverse on both sides. Don't ignore that. Don't, don't be fancy about it. And just like, well, I know what's going to happen. It's, it's fairly important to show what's going on here. So I'm going to write tan of y plus 1 and then tan inverse on the left-hand side of that. It's important to get side correct also. And then negative x minus 3 and tan inverse on the left-hand side of that. Do these cancel, if you will? Do they simplify out when we get y plus 1? Yes, because we're identifying the domain on which that is possible. If we don't identify the domain, it makes it seem like you do it all the time. Well, you can't, because tangent is not a one-to-one -one function. We had to restrict this so that this would be one-to-one -one when we're dealing with it. That's why. That's why we had to deal with domain. When you're first going through domain, you go, why is this important? It's important because it lets what we want to do be possible. Without doing that and restricting it, we can't do that, which we want to do right now. So we're going to get just y plus 1. When we compose inverses with functions, or their, basic, their uh, base function, they, they simplify. We just get y plus 1. On the left-hand side, we get tan inverse of negative x minus 3. 
We simply need to subtract 1 and we'll have solve for the inverse function that will name it as g inverse. Notice it's not f inverse, it's a super common mistake. It's not a huge deal, but it is an important one. That if your function is g of x, you don't want to be going and writing f inverse uh, because that, it doesn't make sense. This is the inverse of the function g. So subtracting 1. We get tan inverse of negative x minus 3 and then minus 1. We're going to call this g inverse of x. If you were to compose it, this whole thing would fit in that variable. What's the first thing you do? You take this whole thing and then you would add 1. Well, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Tangent of the tan inverse would give you negative x minus 3. That negative would say, let's see, positive x plus 3. So x plus 3 minus 3 would give you x. It actually works if you compose these. That's a great way to check your work. You don't have to, but if you're curious, like, hey, does it, does it actually work out? Yeah, it does. But it only does it if this is the input for that function. And likewise, if we find the domain and range for inverse, whatever this is. So our domain is our range from our original function. So our domain says you can actually do this with anything in your inverse function. All real numbers would work there. Why? Because the, the, the domain of your inverse tangent is all real numbers. Plug in anything. It's going to work just fine. The range, however, the range is the domain that we had here. And that says that your inverse function will, at, at minimum, give you negative pi over 2 minus 1, but not including that. That'll be a, oh my gosh, it'll be a horizontal asymptote. Do you remember that about tan inverse, how it has this horizontal asymptote and we're between it? Just like the tangent itself had vertical asymptote and we're between it. So we went like that. This will have a minimum of this, but not ever reach it. It's horizontal asymptote. And then it will, uh, it will get a maximum of negative pi over 2 plus 1. And that's exactly what this, this says for us. So I hope that makes sense. Um, kind of nice finding domain and range first, right? Because you can just reverse them. Just make sure that when you do, that you understand that your range becomes your domain for your input variable. That your, your g inverse of x should not go here. This is your input we're talking about. And likewise, for your range, it should not have an x there. It should have your inverse function. The function will be between whatever your domain was, whatever your x was between here for your domain. That's the point. So we'll come back, we'll do one more. Uh, we'll talk about cosine. Okay, just about done. So we have h of x equals 2 cosine 3x plus 2 and then minus 1. Find your domain first means look at the part of the cosine function that you need to restrict so that you have a one-to-one -one function. And we have that right here. Cosine has to be between, or cosine has to have a domain between 0 and pi, or in the broad sense of a term. Whatever's here must give you something between 0 and pi. Whatever's here must fit between 0 and pi, period, including 0 and pi. So let's go ahead and do that. If we take our domain, we have identified this as cosine, so we're looking from 0 to pi. Write it out first. Cosine's domain must fit there. The whatever's inside cosine must give you something between there. Well, if this is our domain, and this is what's got to fit, let's put this between there. So identify cosine 0 to pi, take this, and put it between those two values. And then we solve them. Um, how we solve for x, remember for those, uh, for double inequalities or compound inequalities here, we, we solve for x, but we're very careful. If you ever have to divide by a negative, remember you got to switch your inequalities. We're not going to see that a whole lot, but you can get it. Be very careful with that. If your domain's getting messed up and you have it out of order, um, make sure that you've, you've actually switched your inequalities. So here we're going to subtract 2 from all of this. And then we'll divide by 3 on all three portions of this. 
It looks kind of nasty, but those are numbers. That is the smallest and largest value that you can plug into this and, and get a one-to-one -one portion of that function. That's what we did it. Cosine is one-to-one -one on, on zero to pi in general. If you start altering what you're plugging in, altering that, that argument, you start altering wh whatever's giving you a one-to-one -one part. This is now what's giving you a one-to-one -one piece of that function. Therefore, this is the only piece that's relevant for us to find an inverse because we only find inverses of one-to-one -one functions. This causes that to happen, so this is our necessary domain for us to do the rest of our work. Is cosine defined everywhere? Yes, it is. It is defined everywhere, but it's not one-to-one -one everywhere. And so we've got to cut it to make it one-to-one -one so that we can find an inverse. Then we find a range. As far as a range is concerned, we don't really have to do a whole lot of work like this. Just imagine cosine. I don't care about this. The largest that cosine can, well, I sort of care about it. Um, there are some times that, um, that you're going to get out some weird things. No, it's, it's very rare, but it, it can affect it. Most of the time what happens is we say, hey, cosine, the largest value you can get is one, and the smallest value you can get out is negative one. So cosine of whatever is going to give you biggest one, smallest negative one. Let's, let's talk about negative one. The smallest value is to give negative one. So two times negative one is negative two, minus one is negative three. The largest value is positive one. Cosine can only give you out between negative one and one. I don't care what you plug in. That's the smallest and largest value you can get. So positive one times two is two, minus one is one. We can show it two different ways. This is going to become the domain of our new function and the range of our new function, our inverse function. So let's find the inverse. We're going to start by replacing h of x with y. We're going to change the y into an x. All of our x's into y's. Then we're going to solve for that y, thereby undoing this function, and that's what inverses come from, is undoing a function. So we've got to isolate this cosine so that we can use cosine inverse. You have to get rid of your constants first. So we're going to add 1 and divide by 2. That's our coefficient or our, common, our, our constant factor if you want to. So add 1, divide by 2. Now that we've done that, add 1 divided by 2, we've isolated the function that we want to find the inverse for. The only thing that's going to get rid of cosine is cosine inverse. We have to do the same thing on both sides and the same position on both sides. So we're going to do cosine inverse. Because we've identified this correctly, this is giving us a one-to-one -one part of this particular function on which we can find an inverse. This says now it's possible. Let's go ahead and do that. We're going to get 3y plus 2 equals cosine inverse of x plus 1 over 2. Almost done. We're now going to subtract 2 and then after that divide by 3. Just remember, where you subtract 2 is important. You're going to subtract it not from the argument of cosine. So not from that, actually it's an it's a x corner of a point, but outside of that. So subtract 2, like right there. And then when you divide by 3, you can do it a couple ways. You can divide the whole thing by 3. Um, most times, you can do both terms divided by 3. You can do that as well. Uh, most times you'll see a 1 third though. So if you divide by 3, It's got to be all three terms, or you need to put this whole thing in parentheses and have a one-third in front. That right there is the inverse function. We're going to call it that. We're going to say this is h inverse stemming from the, the original name of h of x. 
And this decidedly has a domain and a range that are important, and we already found them. So the domain is the range of your original function. Domain of an inverse is the range of your original one. So negative three to one, but now this is our input. So another reason I like to show inequality notation for inverses is so that you really see what's going on. Uh, this isn't this isn't the y value. This is this is the new input value for the inverse. Same thing for range. Our range is this as smallest and largest value, but we'll have h inverse instead of x because this is our output, our outputs for that inverse function. I really hope that makes sense to you. I hope that you understand the necessity to use this domain so that we have a one-to-one -one piece of whatever function we're dealing with so that an inverse is actually possible. You can only find inverses of one-to-one -one functions. That's how we cut it, make it one-to-one, -one, and then to find your domain and range first is very nice. I hope you're seeing that. I hope that I've made it very clear on how you do it. Identify your function, um, your smallest and, and largest values, put whatever's here between them, and solve it. Remember, if you divide by a negative, your inequality switch. You pick the whole thing up off the board and, and reverse it. It does not happen very often, but it can. It can happen. And then your domain becomes your range of your inverse function. Range becomes domain. That's about it. All I really want to show you on that. I hope it's made sense. Next time, what we're going to do is solve some very basic equations with inverse functions. Have a great day.